in less than three hours, on April the 14th, 1912, 1,500 innocent people, including some of the most wealthy and famous figures of the time, lost their lives. The sinking of the Titanic was immediately perceived by the general public to be one of the great disasters of pre-World War I history. It still looms large in the consciousness of our civilization. Over 40 books have been devoted to the subject, and numerous films have either recounted the details of the tragedy or been inspired by it. The Titanic disaster challenged the world's growing reliance and faith in machinery as the answer to all of mankind's problems. As a result of the tragedy, the shipping industry and big business in general came under closer government control, both in the United States and in England. In the years that have followed, the word Titanic has slipped into everyday language, coming to mean the largest and the most luxurious, while connotating overreaching ambition, the limits of human technology in the face of nature, and the absolute power of malevolent destiny. Then suddenly, in 1985, Pictures of Titanic once again appeared in the news media throughout the world, but it was a vastly different Titanic. The discovery of her remains has brought the ship back into the world of contemporary events. She was the largest craft afloat and the greatest of the works of men. She was a floating city containing within her steel walls all that tends to minimize the dangers and discomforts of the Atlantic voyage, all that makes life enjoyable unsinkable, indestructible. She carried as few boats as would satisfy the laws. The ship described here matches Titanic, but these words come from a novel written 12 years before the disaster. There are a lot of strange things about the Titanic, and one of the strangest happened before she was even built. And that was the appearance of a little book uh, in, by Morgan Robertson, an American maritime writer, who wrote of a giant liner bigger than any other that had ever been built, loaded with passengers, Americans on its maiden voyage, that ran into an iceberg and sank. The remarkable thing was that this boat was called the Titan. And of course, Titan and Titanic are pretty close together. The ships were about the same size, the fictional ship and the real ship. They were about the same number of casualties. The iceberg was responsible for both sinkings, and it sort of sets the stage for the Titanic disaster in a kind of eerie, spooky way that I think has never died out. This was an amazing coincidence that happened in 1898 when Morgan Robertson wrote his book. People forgot about it after the disaster. They remembered it at the time, but it was 40 years before I ran across it and was able to use it in doing an introduction to the book I wrote on the Titanic. A Night to Remember. A Night to Remember, originally published in 1955, has remained in print ever since. Almost single-handedly, this book reawakened interest in Titanic, which had largely been forgotten during the course of the First and Second World Wars. Its author, Walter Lord, has written 13 other books on a wide variety of historical subjects, but with A Night to Remember and the film adapted from it, he stands as the father of Titanic's modern legacy. Part of the drama of the Titanic was the British had built the ship, which is the epitome of everything that they believed in and knew how to do, and here it went down the first time it went out. If that was uncertain, how many other things must be uncertain in the world? So there were so many dramas within the drama, and the overall drama of the greatest ship in the world on its first time out, running into an iceberg, made it a gripping tale that you couldn't help but puzzle over and read about and wonder what you would have done if you had been there. I think readers more often feel that reaction than they do any other single one. What would I have done if I had been there? It was a great subject of sermons. Every, I don't think there was a church in America that didn't have a sermon based on the danger of, of overconfidence in the weeks immediately following the Titanic disaster. So that's another aspect of it that makes it full of, of, of interest. And pride goeth before a fall, all these sayings. The Titanic seemed to apply to them and perfectly illustrate them. Maybe we do need something to remind us every once in a while that we're not infallible or that we're going too far in our smugness. 
I think we do get these lessons. To me, a very great parallel could be drawn between the Titanic and the Challenger disaster with the spaceship. In both cases, it was all important to the people running the, the ship or the Challenger, it was all important to keep on schedule. There's no reason why the Titanic had to run at full speed that night into the ice. It was just Captain Smith was willing to take a chance. Nothing would happen because nothing had usually happened. But I think you've got to think of the Titanic as a symbol of change rather than the fact that it made the changes. But it symbolized the old ways giving way to the new. I think that's its chief importance. As a symbol, Titanic has ceased to be a ship or even a single event. It has become a legend, a myth to be used in many ways and told and retold. Titanic will always be with us.